Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames are back home and probably not the road swing we're all expecting for them. I'm Dan, as always, alongside Matt. Matt, they they kind of got the points they needed, but did it in the hardest way possible. Yeah, well, that's the Calgary Flames way. They managed to get four points in the four games against four difficult teams. Uh, so, it, you know, on the whole, that's good, uh, frankly, for... Uh, the caliber of teams they were facing it's just unfortunate that they went uh one two and one or one one and two pardon me to get those four points well, let, let's dive into those the first one was against the colorado avalanche a team that is doing well this year in the flames i i would say i don't want to say it's become a bit of a rival but i think ever since they beat us in the playoffs handedly people have had more interest in these games and um the Flames lost this one by a six to five final, all in regulation. Uh, you know, no matter how good you think the Flames are in this one, Matt, I would say that, you know, if you're letting in six goals, you probably deserve to lose. Yeah. And 9.5 times out of 10. And this was clearly a rope a dope type game. Like the Flames uh, got out to the big 5 3 lead heading into the third period, and then they fell asleep at the wheel for a few minutes. And Colorado scored three quick goals in just over four minutes, and that's the ball game. Well, then our started this one. Coronado was called up at a healthy scratch. Um, I thought that overall, like you said, they fell asleep for a little bit, but I thought they showed well against a top team. Even after they fell asleep, it looked like they put their foot back on the gas for a little bit. Um, and to me, at least, you know, it was just those few minutes and some, so a little bit of. I don't want to say bad luck, but maybe a little bit of bad puck management that let the Avalanche get back in and stay in it. Yeah, and you can't let good teams like that have an inch uh, when you have a multi-goal lead heading into the third period. Exactly. They had a two-goal lead at one point and still ended up losing 6-5. to five. Yeah. Like When you've got a two-goal lead, you have to learn how to manage that lead. Yeah, and it's about making sure that you're not panicking on the ice at any time and doing all the small little things defensively, like the effective chip outs, uh, passing it across to your partners, um, you know, anything to minimize the risk of any of the plays that are going on. You know, it's hard when, you know, you're facing a team like Colorado who can quickly beat you up. It is. And, you know, I guess maybe I don't want to make excuses for the flames, but maybe one of the things that we're not factoring in there, they had five defensemen for all but 15 seconds of the game. In the first 15 seconds, we saw Chris Tanev get hurt. So they were, you know, especially their defensemen, you need a good defensive core against the avalanche. We're playing shorthanded the entire game. Yeah. And that contributed to games following this week where they lost, in overtime, where if they had Tanev playing, they probably get regulation victories. How often have we said this when they're missing Tanev, though? Like, he's one of those guys that you really notice when he's not on the ice. Yeah, and it's no offense to Gilbert or Osterley or Soloviev. Like, it's simply Tanev is a tier better than those guys, and when those guys are put into higher positions, it really hurts the team. It does, for sure. The next night, the Calgary Flames went to Vegas, so a, a very quick turnaround to go from Colorado to Vegas. Took on the Vegas Golden Knights, and some interesting stats going in this one. Uh, the Flames were dead last in 5 versus 5 percentage with .881. They were the second last team to have a player hit 20 points. They only had four wins in the first uh, however many games before this with uh, when scoring first. They've trailed in more games than any team except for the Ducks, and their power play was 28th in the league. And obviously, all those things came back to bite them because another loss, this one an OT loss, the Flames got one point out of it, but a 5-4 to four loss against the Golden Knights. What were your thoughts on that one? Uh, very similar game to um, the Colorado game where they, I thought they had a very effective first two periods. Managed the game rather well. Uh, we're heading into the second intermission with the lead. And in the third period, uh, Vegas quickly tied the game up. 
then late in the game, they Vegas took the lead. Calgary responded with a minute left to go, and they fell in overtime. And it, it it's one of those where good teams you can like another example of it. Like you cannot give good teams an inch. And you know the Flames took their foot off the gas a little bit in the third period, not much, but it was enough to let the Golden Knights take uh, the extra two points. I think this is only the second time the Flames had the lead after two all season. And they had the lead three times in this game. Sort of like we're talking about with the Colorado game. Like when you're up and you have the lead, you have to learn how to play with that lead and how to defend that lead. And it just felt like, I mean, the Flames worked hard. Don't get me wrong. It was a decent game all the way around, I think, for them. But And they got beat by the better team for sure. But it just felt like they worked far harder than they should have had to for one point because they, I I thought they kept making small mistakes that Vegas capitalized on. Yeah. And that that's what separates the flames offensive abilities uh, from the, the elite teams is that the elite players on those good teams know how to create little plays out of nothing. And if you get enough of those, you all of a sudden give up the lead in the third period and it, you know, it ends up in a disastrous result for the flames. This is probably the first game that Dustin Wolf has played for the Calgary flames, not talking about the Wranglers, but for the Calgary flames where I didn't think that he looked bigger than he was like, you know, he's a small man. He always looks like a big goalie for these guys. I thought that Dustin Wolf looked about his size. I don't think he was good. I don't think he was bad. I thought he just, he looked like an average NHL goaltender in this one. Yeah. And you know, to his credit, uh, you know, if you're playing adequately against even an elite team, you know, like that's not bad, especially when you're in your first uh, 10 games as a rookie in the NHL. Um, but yeah, it was not the standard that I think f- fans were expecting, but, you know, also not anything against him. Like he didn't let in any really soft goals. And he did make a few good saves, but it just was not the same kind of play that we come to expect from him. And then on Thursday night, the Flames went to Minnesota. You and me and some of our uh, listeners and fans were down at Bow River Brewing. They hosted us for a meetup that night, which was a a ton of fun. I'm glad we were able to do that. Um, However, the Flames obviously didn't realize we were doing that, didn't want to cooperate. They did not get the win for us. It was a 3-2 loss, this one going into the shootout. Yeah, um... The Flames in the first period I thought were quite poor, um, and the period itself was quite boring um, watching it, uh, but in the second period the Flames really poured it on, they got the equalizer, and then in, early in the third period uh, they took the lead, but immediately surrendered it, and yeah, that was you know it all for the scoring until it went to the shootout. Why... Did they shoot Huberdeau? Like when I when I looked at the shots, okay, Sharon Govich definitely made sense. I could see why you might want to shoot Lindholm. Why do you shoot Huberdeau? You know, it, it's one of those where I'm almost more tempted to see the Flames throw some bizarro candidates out there, like AJ Greer or Dustin Wolf. Anybody, uh, just uh, any Gr- of th- Gr- doing well, I'd shoot him. You know, any of the depth guys that you know, like a Blake Coleman, um, you know, it, it, one of the defensemen other than Anderson, uh, just to uh, throw some different looks because, like, literally, Sharon Govich is the only guy scoring in the shootout at all for the Flames. Sharon Govich, Lindholm, Huberto, and Kadri were the four flame shooters in this. If I was the coach going into this, I mean, I always look at who scored for you that night, but also who's just hot in general. I pr- I think that Sharon Govich made sense to uh, be a shooter. I probably would have shot Blake Coleman. He's looking good. I probably would have shot Zari. Yep, same here. That would have been my and, and three then I shooters. Don't know who, and I, yeah, I would have thrown Mackenzie my... Weger out there. So, Weger, I, I think Greer would have been a decent candidate. Yeah. I think, you know, even Backlund might have been decent, but, like, it just feels like... Even if they wanted to put Kadri as the fourth, I'd be okay with that. But 
Why are we shooting Huberdo? Like nothing about his game right now says, yes, this guy's going to win you the game in one-on-one. Yeah. I know. And I also want to address that first goal uh, that uh, Minnesota scored in the shootout. I do not understand the rule. Oh, the double touch thing? Yeah, because I've only ever heard of it being where if the goalie touches the puck, the play is dead. And I don't understand how you're now able to double tap to get the goal. Like, I I thought as soon as the puck is touched, and if it doesn't cross the line on that play, then it's done. And, you know, like, it seems wrong for everything I've ever heard of a shootout in any sport. Uh, So I'm just uh, still baffled at the call on that one. Yeah, I am, but it's also the NHL. Yeah, I know. And how often are we baffled by calls in the NHL? Well, true. It just it, it's things like this that are little nitpicky plays that help to ruin the confidence in the sport uh, and fairness in general. Like, it, if there's like a specific rule in place where like double touching is allowed, sure. You know, that, that's fine, but, like, I've never seen in any sport where, you know, there's shootouts where if there's a deflection off of anything that you're able to carry on with the play as if nothing happened. Like, it, it just, to me, do, does not make any sense. And I'd really like it if for these plays that are obviously controversial and people were talking about the time, if the NHL would release a video on their website showing it, talking about the decision and then kind of referencing the rule book. And here's why this was a good call or not. Yeah. And additionally, like when similar plays happen, because, you know, I've seen similar plays like this happen and they've gotten called no goals. What separates the no goal calls to the goal call? And, you know, like, is that the standard moving forward? You know, like, it's just the lack of definition. Sort of like, you know, in, yeah, sort of like in law, you know, there's settled law, right? And if you've ever watched, you know, courtroom dramas on TV or even, you know, seen, been in a trial or seen a trial, they always reference settled law. So if this is what we allow, let's talk about it. And maybe let's even have the, the league almost do a video talking to the ref of why did you make the call? Here's what we did. And, you know, even if the ref made the bad call, Okay, now that becomes the new standard because that's the way it was called. Like, I think the, the league needs to discuss more of this or to come out and say, you know what? That's not the standard going forward, and here's why. Yeah, it, it's just the, the ambiguity that is frustrating because, you know, like on the surface, like this feels like a game where the Flames actually won the game. And it was robbed by the call by the NHL because it doesn't represent past case law, as you put it. And so it's like, well, why this and not the other ones then? And yeah, it it just, it rubs, you know, me as a a broadcaster, but also very much as a fan the wrong, wrong way because... It's like, well, then you could just make up the decision on any game at, on a well, whim. And I think the more we sort of have that settled law at the league, when they talk to Toronto or call up to the situation room, they can say, okay, this is what happened on, you know, December 14, 2023 in the Calgary game. So we have to rule it the same way here. Yeah. And it harkens back to like when uh, Coleman scored that one goal in game five, I think it was against Edmonton. Uh, where he kicked it in, but, you know, like, plays have been kicked in all year and not waved off, but that one was, you know, and it's just, like, there, there's just no consistency with how they've played things in the past, and it it just, you know, it, it you never want to have your, the people that are enjoying your product walking away displeased with the service, like, it's one thing if the game sucked, but it didn't. It's how it was delivered that was the problem. And, yeah, you know, it's just frustrating because, like, things like this should not happen in a professional league. It's true. Yep. 
And let's talk about the last game of the week. Hockey night in Canada, Saturday night. The Calgary Flames back home, taking on the Tampa Bay Lightning in the Dome. And this was probably the best game of the week for the Flames anyways. Dan Vladar in net again. Sharon Govich now has a five-game point streak as the Calgary Flames beat the Lightning 4-2. to two. And, you know, this was quite different. Like, the Lightning looked like they couldn't make a pass in that first period, but they started to really press and playing and, you know, their game and looking like the team that they are in the second, especially the third. Um, and it started to look like a challenge for the Flames. And I thought the Flames were able to finally rise to the challenge. Yeah, they took the lessons from earlier in this week and applied it. Like, they weathered the storm. Like, the Lightning scored two goals in a minute and a half uh, to take it from a 3 nothing cakewalk to a nail-biter. And the Flames managed to eat six minutes off the clock without giving up the equalizer when Connor Zari made a play out of nothing and ended up getting the insurance marker and the flames coasted the rest of the way um keeping the lightning at bay to win the game yeah i i think this i don't want to say this is the best full game for the flames so i think they still had some issues here but i thought it was probably the best look at the flames playing the hockey they're supposed to be playing yeah and you know like you can have periods where the other team is dominating uh especially when they're trying to come from a three goal deficit but it's having to learn how to actually be able to close out those games and not have like what happened in colorado what happened in vegas happen continually like if those things happen once in a while it happens but you know the flames need to make sure that they're able to you know shut that all whole thing down for the other team was it weird to you? I know it was really weird to me to see Teba Bay polar goalie with 342 left in the game. Honestly, I would have done the same. Um, and when you, Calgary really, I mean, they had four or five shots in open net and missed them all. Well, that's Calgary. <laughs> um, and it, they they you know, really screwed up that opportunity. Yeah, like realistically, the, the Flames should have had an empty net goal, but um, yeah, the, the bounces just didn't go their way. Uh, the, you know, when you're down by two goals, like it's one thing, like if you're down by a goal, you leave it till like the last minute, minute and a half. But when you're down by two, it's like, you need to get one early reset and then go for the second one. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with that, but I don't know. It was still, I mean, 342 is still a long time to have your goalie out. Yeah. It, it's hard when, uh, you know, you're down by two, like it. Yeah, and the the lightning. I think what the main reason for their decision was that the fact that the lightning's power play is like the third best in the NHL. So why not take advantage of the extra guy in hopes that you're gonna have a repeat, you know, of your power play where you can generate yeah, that, the. You could be right there. Yeah, you because know, like if they had like Calgary's power play, I, I think you'd probably see the goalie in for another minute, minute and a half. Uh, before getting the goalie pulled, but you know, the Lightning are, are a very good offensive team, so I I, yeah, I no, probably you... would have done the same thing in their position. I, I'm it. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. Just it was way earlier than you usually mm -hmm. see. I agree. So so with those four goals played, the Calgary Flames now sit fourth in the Western Conference Wild Card spot in the Pacific Division. We have. Uh, L.A. in the last spot, number three, at 38 points. The Flames now have 31 games played, 12 wins, 14 losses, five overtime losses for 29 points. So they're currently nine points out of third in the Pacific, right above them in the uh, wild card at 31 points to St. Louis. And then the one, two spots are Arizona at 32 points and Nashville at uh, 36 points. So the Flames, what, about four or five points out of a wild card spot. Yeah, four at minimum. Three to tie, four yeah, to be up. Exactly. So they're still fighting for it, but not in at this point. Yeah, it, it seems that the Western Conference is really breaking into tiers. Like you have the top seven teams, uh, Vegas, Vancouver, L.A., uh, Winnipeg, Dallas, Colorado, and Nashville, who are pretty much together in one big lump. Uh, then you have Arizona, St. Louis, Minnesota, us, Seattle, and Edmonton all in another group. 
and then uh, Chicago, Anaheim, and San Jose that are way behind everybody else. Isn't it weird, though? I mean, if you think historically that we're talking about the Coyotes and sort of the middle group. I know. It, it's been a while. I think the last time they made the playoffs was like 2011, something like that. Yeah. Like, so. we're talking about them in the could-be competitive group. Yeah. Well, it's about time. Like, really, they should be on the ascension towards actually being a good team. So it's good to see them actually performing well for a change. So after this week's games, uh, some goaltending news has happened. Jacob Markstrom has been reactivated by the Flames. We know he's been on the injury reserve for seven games now. In order to make that move, Dustin Wolf has been sent back to the American Hockey League to play for the Wranglers, and Ilya Soloviev has also been sent back to the American Hockey League. Um, so Markstrom returns, Wolf sent down, Soloviev sent down. With that, Matt, we're back to the goaltending pairing for the Flames of Markstrom and Vladar, at least for now. But let's talk about both of those goaltenders that we saw over the last seven games. And let's start with Vladar. I've said a lot on this show. I don't know that Vladar is um, a starter or a backup. I don't think we had enough to really know who he was or what his upside is. But he really became the starter over the last little bit. I wasn't sure if it was going to be Vladar. I wasn't sure if it was going to be Wolf. I think it's safe to say Vladar became that starter in Markstrom's absence. After what you've seen from him, What's your assessment on him? Well, this is with sort of regular play. Yeah, this is where like I'm curious to see what the Flames will do because for me the difference between what Vladar brings and what Markstrom's bringing is close enough comparably that I think that uh, Vladar has elevated himself into like I can hold the fort for a couple years in net as the starter and you know, like the the last handful of games, he's been absolutely excellent. Um, so it's one of those where it'll be interesting to see exactly what the Flames do moving forward because Markstrom's also played really well this year, despite his stats looking poor. So you know, like if the Flames can find a way to move the Markstrom contract, I think that's the direction to go, just for dollars and cents reasons alone. Yeah, you you and I threw that around last week a little bit of, you know, could the Flames move that? What would that look like? I think, again, though, this depends on which way this team thinks they're going. If this team thinks that they can be a, you know, a long-run playoff competitor round two, round three, you need to keep Markstrom. I don't think Vladar is your guy at that point. If they're going to do anything else, I think, yeah, I think Vladar has shown, you know what, he's probably – a capable starter on a, let's call it non-competitor team. Maybe it can be more than that. He's still making some mistakes. He's still not looking as poised. As I'd like him to be for a, a long-term starter for a deep playoff team, but that doesn't mean he can't get there. He just needs more time in that. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's going to be interesting to see. And I think that like, especially with marks from just coming back from injury, I think that you'll, probably see Vladar kind of taking the de facto starter spot for the next like week or two um, with marks from getting eased back in instead of like being thrown right into it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the flames have five games left this month and they've got, you know, pretty much between the 24th and the 30th one game. So I could totally see Markstrom playing, you know, in the three games for Christmas one or two because I still think there's a lot of time there to ease him in. You've also got Anaheim on the schedule where you probably don't play him. So, yeah, I, I think you're right, but I think it gives probably the Flames more confidence with Vladar, and I think it means, to me anyways, you have to go to Dan Vladar more often. Yeah, I agree. You know, I mean, I think we've we've seen some interesting goalies here in Calgary over the last little bit. I think David Riddick, who was a starter here, I would say, correct me if you think, I'm not right here has proven he's not an NHL starter. He's an NHL backup. I mean, he went to Winnipeg. He was a backup. Now he's in LA. He's a backup. Like, you know, he was given a starter's role and he was the best we had, but I don't know that he was a starter on a contending team. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I think that that became evident with the flames going out and getting marks from that. They thought that adequate enough, but if you're actually wanting to compete, you need better. And, uh, Vladar, I think, is very much in that same generic group as of right now. Uh, yeah. But he hasn't been given the opportunity to take the ball and run with it, also because Markstrom's here. 
and it, it's hard to tell like beforehand like where Vladar ultimately lands like does he elevate his game and become a good starting goaltender or does he falter and fall into the David Riddick mold and he could go either way and I think right now the Flames can afford for him to go either and, way. And that's exactly the point I'm thinking of is that because the Flames are quasi rebuilding without, you know, fully committing to it, you know, you can start, you know, younger players and give them an actual shot to see if there's more there there. And like we saw this with both Dubé and Majapane over the last year and a half with them both getting more ice time to try and cement themselves as top six forwards and both of them not reaching their abilities. You know, the Flames now have a lot more of a book ready on each of those guys that know they're more fringy NHL guys at this point. So you can make adjustments to your roster accordingly and the Flames just aren't on that end of it with Vladar yet to be able to determine what's the next step. Yeah. And I think even with Vladar, I mean, when I say they can afford it, not only are they trying to get younger, but they have Dustin Wolf. And again, I don't know that Dustin Wolf is going to be the next, you know, goaltender sensation for 10, 20, 30 years in this league. You know, I don't know. He's going to be the next amazing goalie. I think he's going to be a serviceable starter on a competitive team at the very least, but I think that if Dan Vladar looks good, great. Now you've got two good goalies and you can deal one or you can keep one or you can keep them both. If Dan Vladar is given the shot and falters, hey, now we've got Wolf and we've got a really serviceable backup. Yeah, I, I like, like it. It's not like we need to say if it's Vladar and then, oh, crap. If he doesn't work, now we got to go and find someone. I think the next guy either way is right behind him. Yeah, I liken it a lot to uh, how Anaheim had Frederick Anderson and John Gibson for a time where Anderson became a quality starting goaltender, but Gibson was clearly better. And, like, once Gibson had enough time to take over the starting role, they were able to ship Anderson out, got an excellent return for him, and were able to, you know, make the team better by having two good goaltenders. And I think the Flames, like, if things work out, you could see Vladar basically being the Flames version of Freddie Anderson in that case. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a great recent example. Um, you know, I can think of a couple others, but that's probably the more recent one. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think even if you keep, let's say the Flames do their due diligence and decide not to or can't trade Vladar or, sorry, trade Markstrom for whatever reason, um, and, you know, we won't get into what a trade may or may not look like now, but if they can't or decide not to, I think that, you know, we know Markstrom's getting older. Right. I mean, we've seen, I think, the effects of age over the last couple of years get to him and even some of the um, the effects of injuries getting to him. I mean, he's 33. I think even if you keep him, you got to start adjusting that workload now because Dan Villar has proven he deserves more. I'm not saying he deserves 50 goals a year or sorry, 50 games a year. But, you know, you, I think you've got to start just adjusting that workload. Say, let's give the 33 year old less and let's put a little bit more weight on the 26 year old shoulder. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and especially, like, when you're starting to add, like, contract considerations, the $6 million guy versus the $2.5 million guy, like, those things do creep in. Like, especially, like, if the Flames are planning to kind of, like, retool on the fly, like, that $6 million in cap space all of a sudden becomes a huge asset where they can then go out and, like, either sign a free agent in the offseason or acquire a contract dump from another team that's a good player you know sort of like how the flames were able to get sharon govich uh in the Tafoli trade because they didn't have enough money to spend on his roster spot that he warranted yeah i think you know we we won't yeah i, I don't think we'll go back and forth on you know markstrom and you know trading him anymore i, I think you know it's viable either way and i could also see that Conroy looks at that and says, you know what? The more valuable chip right now is Dan Vladar. And let's move on from that. I think it's it's a flip of a coin right now. Yeah. Um, but the other guy that we saw this week, who's now played this season five goals at the National Hockey League level, was Dustin Wolf. And a lot of excitement with Wolf coming to the Flames, getting some time to play. 
I, I'm hoping that his time on the bench was just as valuable as time in net in terms of learning from NHL goalies and seeing what Villar was doing and that sort of thing. But overall, what was your assessment of Dustin Wolf during this uh, short call-up? I think he showed that he's basically ready for the NHL. Um, he might not be like ready to be the starter uh, by any stretch of the imagination, nor is he expected to be. But he did not look over his head um, against any of the teams. Um, he played well. He won a couple of games himself uh, by making some spectacular saves. Uh, on the whole, it was very encouraging in my books, and it's just a matter of sorting out the other two guys to figure out how to get him here on a more permanent basis even though that I'm not really expecting that until like either late in this season or next year. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with a lot of your assessments. I think having him not just for one game, but seeing him semi regularly over the last couple games here, a couple weeks here, I should say, I think we started to see that there are some chinks in the armor. There are some things he needs to work on. I think for me and for some fans I talked to, both at our meetup and I've talked to online, people started to realize that he's not Superman at the NHL level. He may have looked like that at the American League level. He might have looked at that at the Canadian junior level. But there's definitely some things to be worked on there. And as I said earlier, I still think he can be a starter. I still think he can definitely, you know, evolve into that. But I'm not of the opinion a lot of people are, which is let's give him to the NHL right now. Do what you got to do to bring this guy in. He's the savior for the Flames. I think that going back to the American League for a bit is probably going to be a good thing for him. And yeah. I think there's a prospect we need to take slowly. It was good to see him over and over and see, you know, how he dealt with adversity and how he dealt with coming in after not playing. And even his first game when he played against Minnesota in the Dome, how he did coming in as a backup. Because to me, that's probably what he will be. And you need to see how a guy does coming in cold mid-game. And I think he met or exceeded every expectation the Flames had during this time. But I still think he's a young goalie. There's still some stuff to learn. And I think we need to be still have some patience there. Yeah, and realistically, like NHL players are bigger, stronger, and faster than their AHL counterparts. That's why they're in the NHL. So he has to realize that, oh, well, the little cheats that he might be able to get away with in the AHL... Um, you know, the players are a little smaller or a little slower or whatever. Like, he can work around other teams' players. But in the NHL, like, those guys are standing in front and being able to tip pucks very effectively or get their big rear ends right in front of you so you can't see a damn thing. And, you know, how to adjust to those kinds of things where in the A, like, he can work around those things a lot better. So, you know, it'll be good for him to go back and learn and, you know, parlay those adjustments to make sure that he's doing the right NHL habits in the a AHL and incorporating that into his game full time. Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact wording, but during a at least one, I think two or more of his press availabilities, he talked about how the shooters are much uh, faster, you know, the shots come faster and harder. These guys are bigger and they're in better placements. So I think now that, you know, we've seen that and he knows what to expect. I, I don't think it's ever good for young players development to think that there's nothing more to learn to say, I'm so good at the HL level. I don't need to learn anything. And I'm not saying he had that kind of thought. Cause I don't know, but I just want to make sure that, you know, when he goes back to the HL, the flames have talked to him and said, Hey, here's the things you need to work on. And yes, you know, you've mastered the HL level, but keep working on these things or maybe, you know, get a little bit sharper at these things when you go back down there. So there's still something he's working on and not just going through the reps waiting for the call up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, like, he, like, if the Flames, like, say, lost either Markstrom or Vladar for the rest of the season, you know, like, would I be comfortable with him being in the NHL for the rest of the year? Yes, definitely. Um, it's just, for right now, I think that him learning in the A and taking things slowly is going to be ultimately better for him long term. Yeah. And I think we had the best chance to evaluate and we have yet having multiple NHL games 
very quickly. You know, like I, I think so often we see a guy for one game and we go, oh, yeah, he looks great. Bring him up. Well, when you see him sort of like we saw with Coronado at the beginning of the year, right? You see him, you see him play, you see him do well, you see him struggle. And the more you're seeing what they are, the better you can evaluate them for good or for ugly. Yeah. You know, and I think we got to see that here, which I think was really important for a young goalie. Oh, definitely. Uh, just some very encouraging signs all the way around with him. For sure. Uh, Matt, I thought it might be fun here. You and I and a lot of the Flames fan base, the Sea of Red, were worried when Matthew Phillips left in the offseason. For those who remember, Matthew Phillips has played for the Wranglers, for the Stockton Heat, um, had an amazing year last year for the Wranglers, 76 points, 66 games. A lot of talk that, you know what, he wasn't getting a chance in the NHL. Daryl didn't want to really bring him off. He played two games last year. He went to Washington. I thought we'd check in and see how he's doing his first full NHL season and if this was really the one that got away for the Flames. Yeah, his one goal this season came against us, and he has five yep. points. Exactly. So he's played 20 games. He has one goal that came against the Flames. He has four assists for a total of five points. And I know there was a lot of excitement in the preseason when he was being put on a line with Ovi, and, oh, he's going to do so well. Right now he's on a third line with uh, Joe Sneevely and uh, Kuznetsov. So, I mean, Kuznetsov, I'd say, you know, still a, a good center, but taking a bit of a step back. To me, if he's not getting, if he's on the third line, not getting a lot of points on Washington, who I think the team is struggling, I think he definitely would have struggled to secure a, a spot with the Flames. Yeah, I don't think he'd be in the NHL right now, frankly. No. So, you know, I mean, we weren't sure what to expect. And there's how many of these guys, you know, they're often called quad A. These guys that are too good for the AHL, not quite good enough for the NHL, or not quite good enough, I guess, to you know, really make a difference in the NHL level. I'm sure he can get an NHL job. Everybody needs a guy like that at some point. But looking back at his first half of his NHL year, and, you know, he went with his AHL coach, and we thought, oh, that's going to be great. You know, he'll get so much time there um, because, you know, the coach will be working with him. I'd say he's probably, and, and we'll see what happens going forward. But so far, we haven't really missed out on anything. No. I think he would probably hold the spot that, AJ Greer holds on the lineup and I'd rather have Greer at this point. Yeah. And you know, it's looking at, um, guys like AJ Greer and Matthew Phillips and Dylan Dubé and Andrew Majapane that is getting me on the page of, um, less short players period on this team. And like, even if you're replacing them with just bigger guys that aren't necessarily the most skilled, that it will end up as a net benefit for your team because how many times do we see Mangiapane and Dubé getting muscled off the puck just because they're smaller? And Phillips has the same issue in Washington as he did here in the farm team. And it, it's just hard. And unless you're a talent level like Gaudreau, like you can't really get away with being that short. I think that's a great way to look at it. You know, some of those top guys can get away with it, and I think they can compensate around it. I mean, how often did we see Gaudreau get slashed on the hand, slashed on the wrist? Like, it's not like he was, you know, immune to that, but he learned how to work around it. Yeah, to, well, like Patrick um, Kane, you know, I guess, uh, for example, has he, been... He, le he learned how to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, like Patrick Kane, for example, is a Hall of Famer, and he's not very much taller than Gaudreau. But he was able to work around it because he's actually that good. He's a legit Hall of Famer. And, you know, you basically need to be, like, either a good first-line forward or, a, a, you know, all-star Hall of Fame guy in order to get away with it. Otherwise, you kind of fall in the same mold as guys like Tyler Ennis, who are very skilled but get pushed around way too easily. Yeah, no, I th I think that's uh, that's a good look at it too. So, and how I do say, I just, um, I just want to add on that you know, like looking at the, like the Flames' fourth line when you have a guy like Greer out there, uh, and he's not the most skilled guy, but he's adequate. But he just creates havoc because he's the guy imposing his physicality on the other team, and he can change the course of a period in the game by himself just because he's able to engage properly but with the other two guys like unless they're scoring they're a net negative on the team 
I think with AJ Greer too, he knows who he is and he plays a very different game. And to me, watching Matthew Phillips play a little bit in the NHL this year, I don't know who he is. He seems like he's just, you know, generic NHL player number or whatever. Yeah. Austin Zarnick 2.0. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, Zarnik didn't look great here, but he's still around. I think especially with, you know, 32 teams now, we need guys that can play hockey. I think Phil's probably an NHLer, but looking back at his 2023 so far, I'm not feeling like we maybe were, some fans were at the beginning of the year, that, oh, wow, you know, this is the one that got away. I think maybe, you know, as much as we gave Sutter and potential tree living a hard time for not bringing them up and giving them more. Maybe they saw some or knew some that we didn't at the time. Yeah. And also I think a good reflection that when we're seeing guys like Wolf or like Cornot or some of these guys are looking amazing at the HL level, it doesn't always translate to the national hockey league. No. And you know, and to put a case in point in that, um, like the flames have a good prospect that's, uh, rebounding after a disastrous season last year rory karens and you know like he was a late round draft pick in 2020 i do believe he was in the sixth round yeah 174 overall in 2020 and you know he's finally rebounding and is looking like he's ready to take the next step just in the same way that uh, connor zari has but it's like okay First step one, get to the NHL, then okay, now what? And like we saw with Matthew Coronado, that he's not been very effective at the NHL level. Peltier was good for a bit, but he regressed because, you know, fatigue issues last year. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see with all of those guys. So as we're looking, I'm, I mean, we are slowly closing in on the end of 2023 here the flames don't have a lot of games left this year as you look ahead to 2024 if the flames want success however you're going to define success for this year what needs to change in 2024 i think the flames need to embrace the youth movement uh more um you know and they have uh done a very good job um thus far this year uh They've fostered all the guys that warranted it and have managed the ice times effectively, and I think they just need to keep doing that. Um, how would you say the on-ice results are almost secondary, uh, whether the Flames win or lose, as long as the, they're instructing the young guys properly and giving them the best opportunities to succeed. And, you know, the, the chips will fall where they may. Like, uh... Because there are too many question marks with this team still. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you about the young guys. I think you and I are both on the same page of what this team is right now. And this team is a team that needs to, we won't use the rebuild word, but needs to get younger. A team that needs to, you know, let those young guys play. And I think to add on to what you're saying, for me, the Flames need to maximize their assets. They, I don't expect them to trade everybody that they have. I don't expect them to move long-term deals. I don't expect them to move Markstrom. I don't expect them to move those kind of guys, but all of their UFAs that are coming up, they need to get the best value on yeah. at least those guys. Yeah. And, and if I that's think that signing they need them to... or dealing them either way, they need to figure that out one way or the other. And honestly, I'll be honest. I think all three of them need to be dealt. I agree. Uh, the only guy I would m maybe keep was Hannafin. Yeah, I, I I can see that, but I think that for where the team is, there's more value to moving him and getting the assets. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Flames need to make decisions, even if they're not going to tell us publicly or come out and execute on them. What is Dylan Dubé? What is Andre Mangiapane? Are these guys that we look at as part of the core going forward? And I think that the team needs to really decide what these pieces are. And honestly, with each of those guys, like if the flames are offered anything for them they should strongly consider moving them not just for the sake of moving them but uh how do you say part of retooling and rejiggering your team is moving out parts that are not quite performing to expectations and trying out new things and you know like the flames needed some youth and speed uh, and they moved out to foley last year they got sharon govich in 
Uh, they moved some of the fourth liners out. They managed to get AJ Greer. You know, if they move out guys like Manjapane and Dubé, like, you know, you could slot Peltier in Dubé spot. You know, Coronado can get more of an opportunity. Like, there are plenty of options uh, available to this team to be consistent with the retooling, rebuilding thing and, you know, actually make an impact on the roster as well to turn it over. Yeah, I, I think so for sure. And I think to go along with that too, I would say they need to find guys who can play different roles. You know, I think Zari's come up and played a specific role. Postal's played a role. We can't just bring guys up for the sake of bringing them up. I think AJ Greer is a great example of that. He came up and he's filling a role. Is he your top center? No, but not everybody can be. Is he your top, you know, defenseman? No, but not everybody can be. I think we need to find guys who we can say, you know what? this guy is going to fill this role and do it well. And I think the Flames also need to move away from guys that have been here just because they've been here for a while. You know, I think guys like Japani, like Dubé, sometimes you can't dance with the devil you know. You just need to say, you know what, it's time for a change. And I think some of these guys are getting to that point. Yeah, and realistically, like this team as it currently stands, is not going to get any better than being the middling playoff team if they make it or, you know, just outside if they don't. So, like, unless they, you know, tear down certain parts of the team and, you know, get new people in, like, you're basically stuck in that same mold. And, you know, like, it was like how I've mentioned previously with Manjapane, his buyout being $2 million and like that sucks, but you know, he currently is not contributing as a $4 million player, which would be the cap savings for buying him out. You know, just getting a different $4 million player who's playing like a $4 million player. Like, could you imagine like going out and getting another Blake Coleman, for example, cause that's basically a comparable contract, you know, and the impact, like having another guy like that on the team versus what Manjapane brings, like that's a big difference. And, you know, like you can make your team actually better by, you know, swapping out parts. And I'm expecting that come the new year, we're going to start to see the Flames have some uh, trade partners. I think, you know, usually in the new year is when teams decide who they are and start to make those moves. So I'm I'm strongly, you know, expecting sometime in January we see a trade that tells us which direction the Flames are going. Well, and how do you say, like, I don't really look at the fact that, like, the Flames are three points out of a playoff spot because, yeah, they technically are right now. I look at the fact that they're nine points out of the main group of seven teams. And, you know, like, there, you have, like, six teams vying for one spot and then seven teams above them. Like, realistically, we're, you know, Edmonton is likeliest to get that spot of the bottom-ish teams uh, now that McDavid's better. And... It, it's hard to overcome all of those teams just to get an eighth spot. So, like, realistically, like, this team should sell in the new year. It's just... Well, in a lot of ways, I think actually being that far out is a bad thing. Like, it means they're going to get a worse draft pick, and it also means that, you know, I think that there might still be some hope there. Yeah. I know, and that, so, that's where like the Flames are kind of in no man's land right at the moment, but I think that that will quickly change, and frankly, like the Flames still have, you know, 50 games left on the schedule, like, it, it, you know, the, if they trade off guys like Lindholm, Hannafin, Tanev, like, they're, they're going to be bad, like, we have saw how bad they were just with Tanev being out and everybody trying really hard to cover Tanev. You delete Tanev from the team and, you know, play, say, 20 games without him, like, you're going to lose a lot of those games just because he's not there. And, you know, then you add Hannafin on top and Lindholm on top, like, you're going to lose a lot just with those three. They very well could, yep. Um, I guess maybe to sum this up, I think, what do the Flames need to change in 2024? Then For me, they need to... F they need to figure out who they are. And I think right now they don't know who they are. And for me, they need to figure out who they are and move in that direction. Yeah. 
and realistically, like, things will sort themselves out by themselves. Like, like this team isn't... But I'm just hoping they don't make the wrong decision of who they think they are or who they want to be. Yeah. Oh, I know. You know well, l- like, and- the last thing that they need to do is hold on to any of those UFAs. Like, realistically, unless they're signed uh, to long-term contract extensions... Like, any of those three being on this team post the trade deadline is a travesty and a failure of the management. Like, it, you know, it's one thing if they're signed, but if they're still, like, UFA at the end of the year, like, that's just dumb asset management. Yeah, I just worry that management might say, you know what, we want the now and not the later. And so... Yeah, I know, which I'm is the Calgary now. Flames way, and that's how you get into, like, a 10-year rebuild, too. Exactly. And so I'm hoping that that's why I said I hope that we know soon which direction they're going to be moving. Yeah. In. Um Matt, let's let's leave leave the week that was there. Um we'll let everybody know that as we get close to the holidays, we're going to be taking some time off for the holidays. Um next Sunday, which when we usually record will be the 24th of December, we're not going to record on Christmas Eve and then really there's only one game between then and the next Sunday or two games, I guess, if you count Sunday, the flames play the 27th is the only game of that week against the Kraken. And then again on the 31st. So we'll be taking the 24th and the 31st off and we'll be back to cover the flames and everything that's happened on the 7th of January. So we're going to take a couple weeks off to spend some time with our families. We hope everybody does as well. But let's look at what's coming up. We won't do the same predictions we usually do because it's a lot of games. But let's recap this. If we look back at last week, I thought we'd beat Colorado and lose the rest. You thought we'd beat Minnesota, Colorado, lose Vegas, Tempa. And we ended up winning Vegas, losing the other three. So I had the right games, wrong teams. Yeah. The right number of wins. Yeah, the the teams, like, well, they got the right number of points anyway. They got four points. That's yeah, and like all, ulti- they did the hardest way they yeah, could. Yeah, uh, well, I guess technically they could have lost every game. Yeah, ultimately, you know, going up against that uh, quad of teams, you know, and getting going five hundred in the points percentage, to me, that's a win. Uh, just because you know, <laughs> it, it's not like you're playing the basement teams. Like those are four dynamite teams. So, you know. Um, they just have to keep it up against other teams. So let's look ahead at what's coming up between now and when we broadcast next. Uh, the Flames have three games this week. They're at home for one more on Monday the 18th, the 7.30 start time against the Florida Panthers, who we just saw play at Edmonton. Um, then on the 21st, they go for their last road trip before Christmas. They're going on their California road trip. They'll take on Anaheim on the 21st. On the 23rd, they'll take on L.A. And then they're off 24th, 25th, 26th. They play the 27th. They're off the 28th, 29th, 30th. They'll play the... uh, They'll play a home game after that on the 31st, a New Year's game. I remember when that was always Montreal. And now, for some reason, we're seeing the Flyers who nobody cares about. Yeah, and 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 Vancouver has been there and Edmonton's been there. It's been those four teams just cycling yeah. through with whomever makes sense. Teams you can sell tickets to. Yeah. Um, and then the Flames will go on a four-game road trip to open the next month where they'll be in Minnesota on the second. They'll be on uh, the fourth. They'll be in Nashville. Then they'll take on the Flyers again. It's kind of weird for me when you see like those Eastern teams where you play one home, one road, and we're done both in a week. Like this one is kind of weird to me. On Saturday the 6th, they're in uh, Philly to take on the Flyers, and on the seventh, a uh, back-to-back, they take on Chicago. And Matt, we talked about this before we started recording. That sixth and seventh game, Philadelphia is an 11 a.m. start time, our time, and then Chicago 1 p.m. start time. When was the last time we saw a back-to-back where they're both matinees? I think you have to go back like six, seven years. Uh, I remember there being a weekend where we played Philadelphia and Washington back-to-back in the afternoon. Uh, but yeah, that was a long time ago. Like I, I yeah, know Monahan I, scored the game winning goal in one of those. I think it was an overtime goal, but yeah, it, yeah, it, it's been a while. It, it's, and it's probably going to be weird for the guys too. So looking at this overall, not a hard schedule for the flames. I mean, the Panthers kind of a middling team. I'd say that the flames we've got, um, the Ducks, who they should beat. I'd say the Kraken, who they should beat. 
the Flyers, who they should be twice. For the rest of this month, I think the only real challenge is L.A. What do you think? Pretty much. Uh, Philadelphia has been really good lately, too. So They have, but I, I think just like the Flames went on a streak, I still don't think Philadelphia is a good team. I think they're a, a hot team. Yeah, well, Tortorella is really milking everything out of that team possible. Like, he has Rustalainen actually playing like he's an NHL defenseman, so... Yeah, that's true. And I find, though, that with Tortorella, uh, things start to level off about the 30 game mark. Yeah. And, you know, I think he's come in and he's done some of that, but I I don't know if it's going to last into the new year. Yeah, at least they're having a lot better season than than they've had lately. Like that's been a team that has been criminally under... uh, playing their abilities for a while now so it's nice to see them at least competitive at the moment so with uh four what is it three four five games left in this in this month do you think the flames will be 500 um looking at who they're playing uh it's gonna be tough i i guess to be 505 games you would need five points you need two wins and a point somewhere else. Yeah. It's going to be hard. I think like, I think they can take Anaheim and I think they can possibly take Seattle, but uh, those other three games are going to be really tough for them. So they'll come close. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how they fare against the good teams. And then going into that long road trip to start January, it's a tough road trip going from Minnesota to to or sorry minnesota to nashville nashville to philly philly to chicago in you know let's call it five days um do you think they can go 500 on that swing uh probably not i think they'll probably do 500 to finish off this calendar year i think they're gonna falter starting the new year and i don't think that they'll get 500 on that road trip yeah like between the nine games the most i could see them realistically getting is maybe 11 or 12 points but that would be, you know, if they're playing really effectively against all the bad teams and halfway decent against the good teams. But what if what's happened so far leads you to believe that's going to happen? I know. That's where I'm saying, like, that's the max cap I could see is a, like a six and three. Yeah. But yeah, uh, four and five is, I think, roughly what you're going to see in the, those nine games. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't even think about exactly how many. I just thought, yeah, you're right. It's probably not going to be it's probably not going to be 500 for all nine. I think they have a better chance of picking up some points this month, but they're going to I think fall behind early in January and they're going to continue to fall behind, I think, when I look at the rest of their schedule. Yeah. It's not fun between now and the trade deadline. It sure isn't. Well, Matt, I think that wraps things up for us for the calendar year. I hope you have a great holiday. I hope everyone that's listening has a great holiday. Uh, Enjoy some Flames hockey. Enjoy some time off. Enjoy time with friends, family, or however you celebrate. And we'll see everybody in 2024. As always, go Flames, go. Happy New Year. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.